this session is an introduction to the course feminisms beyond global and local this is a basic introductory course an introduction to the diverse feminisms that have emerged in different geopolitical re uh, regions over time and space and it's a course that is organized around five modules module 1 to which we'll get introduced today is a module that would introduce us to the framework of the course so to say and we'll come to that a little later the second module will introduce us to going beyond the classics exploring difference in the us and in europe this module will start with the question why is it that our understanding of what is called second wave feminism or basically feminism that emerged in the 1960s and 70s why is it so whitewashed why have we assumed that this feminism is really all about a set of classics five or six classics written by white feminists in the 1960s and 70s and we shall to this purpose try and explore what were the other feminisms other voices and feminisms that emerged during this period try and see how the racial and ethnic and class status of women the movements from which they came and the structure of the relationship between the different movements of the period actually influence the kind of feminisms they articulated and we would try to do this through a comparative understanding of different manifestos of different feminist groups during that period or try and understand this word difference in terms of really looking at how feminists in the same period from different political positions looked at the same issue an issue like rape issue like sisterhood an issue like class and capitalism differently and try and therefore understand this word difference the concept of difference through this exercise and then we shall turn in a sense to understanding how feminisms from one location travel to another location and in this case take up the case of french feminism for most of us french feminism that travels through the anglo american translations equates to writing body feminisms or feminisms by the trinity uh, written by uh, helen sisu or um, uh, christeva julia christeva or luce irigari right so why is it that a certain kind of french feminism reaches us and what happens when french feminisms travel through a more dialogical project between indian and french feminists does this open up the understanding of difference in french feminisms for us is an exercise we will undertake the third module this was module 2 third module close to home exploring sameness and difference is really about coming to feminisms closer on the geographical map to home or to india what perceptions of women's assertions of feminisms do we have for instance of women in pakistan in bangladesh in nepal in sri lanka are in many ways are assumptions based on zingoistic nationalism or is it that we quickly assume sameness with spaces that are closer home or then a radical difference and how may we therefore explore this through looking at diverse feminist voices in nepal in sri lanka in bangladesh in pakistan and do a comparative reading with india so to say we also want to raise in this module the question of is there therefore an asian or a south asian feminism can we talk about asia can we talk about south asia and therefore asian feminism and south asian feminism and we shall try to explore this question by looking at round table dialogues by chinese feminists particularly focusing on feminisms in china during the cultural leap the cultural revolution and also in the post globalization period so to say and try and explore this question our whole focus in this module will be what happens to frameworks of comparison themselves when western modernity is no longer the sole frame of reference when we are now comparing south south what happens to our very frameworks of comparison will be the major focus in this module in module 4 we'll turn to again something that 
is of contemporary interest, we'll turn our attention to Islamic feminism going beyond mindless return to tradition. We often understand Islamic feminism as only a mindless return to uh, tradition. And so we shall begin this module by looking at the dominant media images of radical Islamism and particularly concentrating on the whole debate that came up post 9-11, responses by left intellectuals and responses by feminists to try and understand what does a grounding in gender do to understanding of radical Islam. And then we shall turn to a more detailed attention to Iran. And why Iran? Because the 1979 Islamic Revolution is often understood at the, as the beginning of radical Islam. And therefore, we shall turn to Iran to try and understand the different phases of feminism and the different phases of modernity in Iran. The constitutional revolution, then the Shah's regime or what is the modernization project from above, the Islamic revolution and 30 years after the Islamic revolution. And we shall particularly look at different sites of feminism that emerge in Iran, particularly cinema. So we shall, wa uh, we shall discuss films like uh, Two Women, Hidden Half, or Offside, or Unruled Paper, to really see how cinema, writing, sports emerge as sites of feminism, maybe in regions where Mus uh, women are living under Muslim law, as it is called. Right? So, uh, we, we get introduced to different and diverse sites of feminism in the uh, first place uh, here and then turn to a selection of writings from a collection, 100 years of writing by women in the Arab world and engage with these writings, discuss these writings to really try and again go back to the question, how may we understand feminism as not just aping the West? Or if it is religious feminism, then just as a mindless return to tradition. How do we reach to a more complex understanding of feminisms in diverse regions, so to say? And our last module will turn to feminisms as a legacy of the revolution. And here we shall turn to two different geopolitical sites, Latin America and the erstwhile Soviet bloc, so to say. In Latin America, we shall do a comparative reading of the revolution in Nicaragua, El Salvador and the Chiapas revolution, which looks apparently like similar experience. But then why is it that different feminisms emerge from these revolutions? How do we understand the ways in which gender relations in the process of the revolution lead to diverse paths for feminism? And going to the erstwhile Soviet bloc, we'll try and understand feminism, official feminisms of the socialist period, as also the diverse forms that feminisms have taken in the post-socialist regime. Our effort here will be to understand both the legacies of the revolution for feminism as well as for anti-feminism and do a more comparative uh, reading here. So, in a sense, through these five modules, what might be apparent is that this course has following four or five objectives. Very simply put, it seeks to question, to interrogate meanings of feminisms that circulate in the commonsensical or even in the academic sphere, which equate feminism to Western. Secondly, the course will try and understand what are the limitations that are posed by classifying or categorizing feminisms into very simple categories like Western and Eastern, global and local, global and maybe a series of national, regional, indigenous and so on. So what are the problems with such a classification? To try and understand these limitations is one of the objectives of the course. The third objective of the course would be to try and explore how multiple voices of feminisms emerge from diverse locations, diverse economic, political, cultural locations and to try and therefore delineate diverse feminisms both within and across different regions or different nation states even. Fourthly, our objective will also be to understand these diverse feminisms 
as not just challenging their own local patriarchy so to say but also in many ways uh, these feminisms are challenging the claims of some feminisms to be universal or global the claim that some feminisms make about being local or about being universal or um, uh, about being global are challenged by uh, these feminisms and our last objective in this course more or less would be therefore to try and do a comparative and relational reading of the diverse feminism so the objective is not to just enlist uh, all the multiple voices in feminism but to do a comparative and relational reading of these feminisms in a sense to see how they are different but also how they are connected by the histories of colonization empire war revolution and also structural inequalities of race class caste so on in a sense this entire course therefore built around five modules will proceed through videos through podcasts through discussion boards also through uh, in many ways uh, maybe um uh, 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 course wikis which would give background materials for engaging with issues that we are actually dealing with in the uh, class every module would begin with a set of objectives which i explicitly stated and questions through which we will pursue these objectives and the module would end with a response quiz which would be really a quiz for learning analysis have we achieved the expected learning outcomes together right so the response quiz would be aimed at doing a self analysis of the learning that we have uh, done through that particular uh, module the evaluation and assessment of the uh, uh, course would largely proceed through one as we earlier said the response quiz also through website reviews through web search so uh, predefined research projects through uh, web searches through social bookmarking to generate collective resources for our learning for this course and also a semester end essay the whole effort in the first module will be to try and set a framework for the course to understand why we are moving from the singular to the plural from feminism to feminisms would be the uh, theme that we are dealing with in uh, module 1 and our objective in this module would be to try and at the first level address the how and why questions in studying feminisms why do we study feminisms and how may we study them which will also involve therefore how are they generally studied and how may we uh, study them secondly we want to try and understand as i just said what are the most commonly used frameworks for the study of feminisms how how do these frameworks represent different or diverse feminisms is the representation of feminisms equal or unequal in these uh, the frameworks we could therefore call them the master frameworks what are the most commonly used the dominant frameworks for the study of uh, feminisms and then we want to go to a larger question of is there a relationship between unequal representation of knowledges and the unequal distribution of economic and political power globally because we want therefore to understand why do different or diverse feminisms get represented unequally how how is it related to the unequal distribution of global power so to say and then we want to also understand as a part of this uh, module try and develop an argument for why the answer to this unequal representation or what we may understand as the european american or the euram dominance why an answer to this is not as easy as listing out a series of national feminisms or local feminisms 
or eastern feminisms or indigenous feminisms why why is uh, what is the problem with posing the uh, series of national or local or indigenous feminisms as an alternative to the uram dominance and lastly as an exercise on the against the background of all this discussion can we try and reorient our understanding of early or what are called as historical feminisms or most popularly as the first wave feminism based on the discussion that we undertake can we try and reorient our understanding of early feminisms or historical feminisms or first wave feminisms which are generally equated to voices from the suffragette movement from the movement for right to vote in uk and usa so can we reorient our understanding so basically four basic objectives of this module would be looking at exploring questions of why and how of studying feminisms two to try and understand what are the most popular ways or most commonly practiced ways of understanding diverse feminisms do these commonly practiced ways of uh, understanding feminisms give equal representation to diverse feminisms and if no then how may we understand this unequal representation of feminisms in terms of unequal distribution of global power and then what seems to be in a sense the answer to this european american dominance and why in feminisms and why the answer may not be something as simple as listing national feminism we'll turn now to the one of the first uh, objectives uh, of this um, module to explore the why and how questions in studying feminism and therefore one of the first questions we want to ask is why is the question why study feminisms asked in the first place any any thoughts on that why why is this question i mean if you were to be in a uh, sociology department or a political science department or a philosophy department the question of why study the history of social thought or why study the history of political thought is not a question that comes up at all but why why is this question asked why study feminisms theoretically or why study feminisms analytically why why may this question be coming up in the first place yeah uh, one would be that uh, since feminisms or feminism comes from a uh, movement some strong idea of experience mm -hmm. it is perhaps not thought of as something which could be theorized upon Okay. okay, and uh, therefore the assumption that experience cannot lead to theory, yeah, and uh, theory is something which is abstract. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, and therefore probably uh, to just take what you are saying um, a little uh, into history, maybe it might help to remember that one of the most concrete results of the women's movement has been the establishment of women's studies. as a field of academic engagement and while we often agree and we know that from within the academia from within the university there was an opposition to the formation of women studies we also need to recall that from within the women's movement not all feminists were convinced of this academic engagement of feminism so uh, as uh, pallavi just said they their their argument in opposing uh, uh, this feminist academic engagement or studying feminisms academically theoretically was really based on a set of arguments one that feminisms has emerged from a grassroots movement from the women's movement whereas theory is about elite academia it emerges it emanates from the elite academia a second set of their arguments was feminism values experience whereas theory is all about abstraction third set of arguments was if feminism is something from the movement it is action oriented it seeks transformation whereas theory is again to them only the assumption being it's only about abstraction 
and we may actually have to counter argue with this set of arguments to make a case for the very cause that we are doing, a, a theoretical engagement with the diverse feminisms. Firstly, we may argue that yes, indeed, it is precisely because feminisms emerge from the women's movement that their entry into the academia seeks to actually transform the very processes of production and circulation of theory and therefore in the long run also transform the elite academia. Yes, we agree that feminisms value experience, the second argument. But in a sense, we also need to recognize that a mere collection of experience cannot take us forward. Abstraction of experience to see the sameness and difference in different experiences is a crucial step to taking that experience forward. And conversely, bringing experience into the sphere of theory might actually lead us to see the limitations of the very nature of abstract theory. So, in a sense, it completely breaks the binary of Absolutely. theory and experience. To say that these are crucially linked and therefore, it, by, through that breaking of binary, fracturing of that binary, say you transform the very structures of uh, knowledge, knowledge making. Or perhaps how we articulate experience itself hmm. is uh, in that sense shaped by how do you understand what has happened to us? Absolutely. absolutely. That itself may be how to make sense of it. How to make sense of it and how to make sense of why your experience is different from mine. Because experience also is located within relations of power. It's not as if outside of that. So to make sense of the fact that you are a woman, I am a woman and yet your experience and my experience is Different. Then it also leads us into the methodological issues of raising a certain uh, uh, dimensions within the studies or outside of Absolutely, absolutely. It also transformed, therefore, not just the sphere of women's studies within the academia, but different disciplinary uh, bodies and spaces within the academia. That, fe uh, that uh, feminism is action oriented and our academic engagement is abstract. Uh, we may counter argue that. We are trying to trace the history of feminist consciousness and therefore see how at different times and in different spaces a counter to dominant ideologies have been posed and therefore tracing this work of counter ideology is a crucial part of action. So once again as you all have argued the whole a binary between action and thought is something that feminism like several other isms that emerge from grassroots movement tries to fracture. It says one cannot go without the other. So in a sense if we have made a case, we, we may argue through these counter arguments that we have just posed that there is a case to engage with feminisms academically. The immediate next question that comes up then is how or why in this course have we replaced the singular feminism with a plural feminism, right? That's the immediate question that comes up because most of us through our undergraduate academic training come to believe that to have conceptual clarity, to be say have clarity on the concept of feminism is to be able to give a definition of the concept, right? So, we often understand clarity in terms of a singular definition. So, why is it that we are moving from singular to plural? Why are we saying it's feminisms? And it's, it's important therefore to try and follow through this course why our focus is on diverse different feminisms as they emerge from different contexts. We shall argue through the course that conceptual clarity is not about singular definitions, but it is about understanding why different meanings emerge from diverse contexts and what may be the conflict, the contestation between the different meanings of feminism therefore. And, and uh, probably therefore to quote 
Adrian Rich in her 1984 essay Notes on the Politics of Location. She says it's therefore recognizing that even those of us with good education need to re-educate ourselves all the while. Right? So it's it's really about finding out what other meanings of feminism was I not aware of and why? And what are these diverse meanings uh, that have come to uh, uh, feminism? But therefore, the second issue or problem that comes up immediately is we should not understand the shift from the singular feminism to the plural feminisms as just a tolerance of multiple meanings. And therefore, if we just go back uh, quickly in time and see that the word feminism, in a sense, it is believed, first emerges in the suffragette movement in France in late 19th and early 20th century, and then in a sense explodes across the North Atlantic zone. It represents now a new constituency, women as a constituency, with a new set of demands, a new agenda, the agenda of equal rights. So, in a sense, the word emanates, it emerges from the life world of white bourgeois women, but therefore to jump to a conclusion that the consciousness that this word signifies is limited to this category of woman, of women, would be problematic, would be erroneous. Because if very, at a very, very simple level, if feminism is just about a simple realization, a recognition that women are discriminated on the basis of sex and that because of this discrimination, some of their needs come to be negated and if these needs are to be fulfilled, then the social, political and economic order may have to be transformed. If we agree on this, then across time, even before the word feminism really comes up, and different spaces, both men and women have reacted to this discrimination, they have reflected on it or individually and collectively initiated change on this. So, they identified themselves as, as, as feminists? They did not identify themselves. And it is therefore when you understand that they are diverse feminisms, that you go back and reclaim that history. Therefore, if I choose not to call, in the sense, myself or um, my perspective as feminist, that also, I mean, it's not just reclaiming the other, but also somewhere I'm choosing consciously not to call uh, my perspective as feminism. That yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, after the uh, uh, political ideology becomes a recognizable field. But in a sense, when you are reclaiming history, as you are saying, you can reclaim some of the text, some of the uh, writings as uh, uh, feminist text. Especially because the meaning now has dominant meaning. Absolutely. So, some people might want to uh, yeah. distance yeah. yeah. themselves yeah. from that dominant meaning. Yeah. 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 And therefore, maybe uh, uh, to carry forward uh, what Anaga is saying, we might have to recognize feminisms as a historical presence, recognize feminisms as a political visible political field as it emerges in diverse spaces and feminisms as a recognizable theoretical field. Yeah, yeah. So, theoretical field, a polit visible political field and as a historical presence, which therefore when a political field and a theoretical field becomes visible, it, you reclaim that uh, history, so to say. Therefore, in a sense, all who have engaged, men and women who have engaged with this question, does gender matter and if yes, how much? Or with the question, what besides gender matters, race, class and how much, have in different ways across time and space really engaged with feminism. And therefore, to refer to it in the singular would be to quote Audrey Lude, just sheer academic arrogance to, to talk about feminism in the singular. But she also warns us that therefore moving to the plural feminisms is not about just mere tolerance, that there are many meanings of feminism. No, 
it's about focusing our attention on the difference between the diverse feminisms in understanding where this difference comes from or understanding how difference or polarities actually spark interdependence so feminisms that are different may not easily unite but we should not forget that they are connected they are connected by histories of colonization histories of race histories of global capitalism so on and so forth so how how do you focus on the difference and not just tolerate the multiple voices in feminism and therefore the question is when diverse feminisms are studied are they studied in this way is our focus generally on the difference or is it that different feminisms diverse feminisms come to be unequally represented with some feminisms thought of as originary and the others in a sense as uh, derivatives yeah so is 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 that what generally happens but are we also looking at how they then uh, with different feminisms are located or uh, identified or uh, looked at then how they also reconstruct or uh, change each other or no yeah we will absolutely look at that in the sense of um, uh, for instance in module 2 um, when we reclaim the history of feminisms of color uh, and uh, uh, of black feminisms in the us as emerging at the same time so to say as white feminisms whereas the popular representation has been that as if white feminisms emerged in the 60s and this came later in a sense we then begin to see these different feminisms as emerging sometimes in dialogue sometimes in contestation with each other and therefore the uh, the focus through our course we have to bring back is to the diversity but also the connection uh, through this uh, diversity so in a sense uh, we we need to therefore give considerable attention to how our diverse feminisms studied and how may we study them so if we go back to the question how are diverse or different feminisms represented and if we take a site here or an example which is very familiar to most of us the way in which different or diverse feminisms come to be organized in the syllabus on a course in feminism a course on feminisms or feminist theory how how do different or diverse feminisms come to be uh, organized so if we take this site and uh, do a very simple exercise of just uh, going on to google and doing a web search on different courses on feminism or feminist theory and look at what are the frameworks that emerge and how in these frameworks are diverse or different feminisms really represented and we would do uh, one um, assignment on this but in a sense if one does a quick review of uh such websites and uh, course materials three models seem to emerge for the uh, which represent diverse feminisms and there could be more but these are the three main models or frameworks uh, that seem to emerge the first could be called the founding mothers framework the second the key text framework and the third the hyphenated wave framework the founding mothers framework is a framework that draws from the founding fathers tradition in political thought or social thought and continues to practice the same kind of exclusions along lines of gender and race that the founding fathers framework practices so that as a student of sociology one might have studied comte spencer durkheim weber and marx as the founding fathers you might not have encountered charlotte perkins gilman or wb du bois so similarly these racial and uh, gendered lines of exclusion continue in the founding mothers uh, paradigm so that you may see uh, uh, see a stream of mothers from where this history really 
uh, uh, starts, so to say. So it could be uh, Mary Wollstonecraft to Simone de Boer, but exclusions along lines of region, race, and gender. You may not find men here in as founders of feminism. The key text approach, in a sense, takes the attention away from individual founders to texts which are seen as classics or key texts in the history of feminist consciousness. The problem with such an approach often is that the context in which this text was produced, the way it circulated, the way it came to be debated, contested, is often lost. And if you look at course outlines that follow this framework, often they seem to practice the same lines of exclusion as the founding mother's framework. So that most of the key texts emerge from the dominant European American tradition. The hyphenated wave model, the most commonly practiced, uh, so to say, is, and some of us might have also encountered it in courses or, uh, on sociology of women or sociology uh, or, or, uh, politics and women that we might have done at the undergraduate level. The hyphenated wave model assumes that feminism as if has emerged in three waves. So the history of feminist consciousness is seen as emerging in three waves. The first wave is almost always equated to the suffragette movement, the movement for the right to vote in UK and USA. The second wave is generally seen as emerging from the new social movements of the 1960s and is generally then unfolded as a series of encounters between feminism and the dominant political ideologies. And so you get a series of hyphenated feminisms, liberal dash feminism, uh, Marxist dash feminism, socialist dash feminism. So a series of hyphenated uh, feminisms with often radical uh, feminism claiming to be the only fundamental feminism, which in a sense stands without uh, uh, any other uh, political ideology uh, that it engages with. The third wave then in such a model is assumed to emerge somewhere in the 1980s as if from the assertions by women in the third world or women of color in the first world who argue that they have been excluded from this history of feminist consciousness. So the third wave is seen as emerging as if from the assertion of exclusion by third world women and women of color. Now the problem in such a framework as might be apparent to you is that such a framework assumes as if that in the first two waves there weren't diverse paths to feminism. As if third world women or women of color prior to the 1980s had not actually traversed different paths to feminism. And such a model therefore in a sense once again denies the agency of uh, third world women and women of color by saying as if these feminisms emerge only in exclusion, right? that they had a different diverse idea of feminism that it might go back to the writings, the diaries of slave girls is something that is completely lost out in such a framework. One of the most sort of commonly practiced framework, if you just search for courses in India on feminisms and feminist theory, and this is something we should pay a little um, uh, serious attention to, one might find a clear cut divide here between courses on feminisms or feminist theory and courses on development theory and practice. It is as if the third world woman or Indian woman becomes visible only in courses on development theory and practice. She is the one with the problems, whereas the theory, the consciousness has all originated in the West, in the European American context. So, yeah. uh, one more thing which uh, struck me on these three frameworks, uh, what, uh, what is visible is the, uh, is the ideology of chronology. Absolutely. So, so you know, rather than history, for example, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, in all the three, uh, absolutely, three absolutely. There is progress from uh, in time of, yeah. of yeah. the different yeah. kinds of feminism and adding up or uh, reacting to uh, 
what is black? It's a unilinear progression through phases. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and we'll come in a little while to that as to how did these master frameworks of consciousness emerge as unilinear frameworks of uh, tracing uh, feminist consciousness. But absolutely, it's not the epistemy that concerns, but the chronology that becomes uh, central in uh, uh, th these kinds of frameworks. So, in a sense, um, in the Indian context, therefore, it's quite, uh, quite common to study feminisms through the uh, wave hyphenated model as originary western and then in a sense ask the question as if is this kind of feminism applicable to India. So in a sense the word applicable suggesting as if this is only derivative. So the different paths of that feminism has traversed, the diverse conditions from which different feminisms emerge is often lost out in such a, uh, a framework. So in a sense, uh, we might want to briefly try and understand how did such frameworks come to be. And one of the works, uh, books that we might find very useful here is Sandoval's Methodology of the Oppressed. where she tells us the whole story, so to say, of how in the 1980s, certain frameworks or classifications became master frameworks or master typologies for tracing the history of feminist consciousness. She argues that though these emerge from the experiences of the white feminist movement, they claimed a universality as if these were the master frameworks in which all feminisms could be classified, could be categorized and could be understood, so to say. And she actually gives us illustrations of three different sites on which these master frameworks organize, classify or categorize the history of feminist consciousness. She says on the site of women's writings, Feminist consciousness is seen, as was discussed earlier, as if progressing through three phases, feminine, feminist, female. It's as if the first phase is when women write to underline that their cultural achievement is just as good as that of men, same as that of men. The second phase is seen as one in which women write in a sense, they reject the sameness with men, but they write to dramatize, so to say, the victimhood of women. So, this is seen as the feminist uh, uh, phase, so to say, of the consciousness. And the third phase is seen as one in which women write to underline the difference from men, but not as a source of oppression now, but as a source of enrichment, as something that gives them an autonomous, or alternative perspective on art and culture as a whole. Superior. superior. So uh, even uh, uh, some would claim superior, some alternative, better. Uh, yeah. So there's also a claim of superiority uh, that may uh, come here, of a supremacy that may uh, come here. Several feminists who took the took women's activism as the site on which they tried to trace the history of um, feminist consciousness, Sandoval argues, once again give us a four uh, stage uh, or four phases through which feminist consciousness seems to uh, have progressed. They see the first phase as one in which women claim that differences with men have been exaggerated and how in fact they are the same as uh, human beings. Okay, both are human beings and therefore a claim for sameness with men is made. A second phase where sameness is rejected, difference from men is highlighted, but it is argued that the patriarchal order needs to be transformed if this difference 
is to be legitimized if it is to be accommodated a third phase generally they see uh, in tracing the history of uh, feminist consciousness as a phase in which women activism underlines the difference from men but as giving them a superior perspective on history and therefore also for defining the futures of society a fourth phase is seen and most scholars see this phase as emerging when feminism is forced as if to listen to the voices that are asserting against their exclusion voices of women of color voices from the third world in a sense multiple voices in feminism are seen as as if emerging in women's activism in this fourth phase by scholars who try to trace feminist consciousness through a history of the campaigns and programs of the women's movement a third site is the site of political thought on which some scholars have tried to understand the history of feminist consciousness and here to a generally a schema of four genre genera have been uh, put forth the first is seen as one where equality with men is claimed the liberal uh, uh, feminist thought so to say second a phase is seen as one in which there is a turn to marxism and a claim made that a socialist society as if would be incapable of subordinating women automatically third phase is seen as one in which um, there is a turn to arguing that women as if naturally biologically know what men are ignorant about which could be called radical uh, cultural feminism uh, as we broadly know it and the fourth is generally seen as a rejection of the first the claim of sameness with men but an integration of the second and third socialist feminist consciousness right and some scholars like alison yager then claim that this will move towards a anti race feminist consciousness as if from the socialist we will move to a anti race feminist uh, consciousness in a sense to understand really the limitations of these master frameworks to understand how they derive from a certain experience namely the white women's movements experience and yet claim universality as if they can encompass within this framework diverse feminisms it might help if we do a detailed reading of two texts from two different geopolitical uh, locations so jono truth a freed slave woman speaking 1840s united states mukta sarve a young girl in a school uh, run by savitri bai phule and jyotiba phule in colonial maharashtra in india and try and see where would these voices quote and quote fit in these master frameworks that have been suggested for organizing the history of uh, feminist consciousness uh, or feminisms if you like sojourner truth entire woman sojourner truth 1795 to 1883 was born into slavery in new york state She gained her freedom in 1827 when that state emancipated its slaves. At the age of 46, after working in New York City as a domestic for some years, she felt that she had been called by the Lord to travel up and down the land testifying to the sins against her people. Dropping her slave name Isabella, she took the symbolic name of Sojourner Truth. She spoke at camp meetings, private homes, wherever she could gather an audience. By mid century she was well known in anti slavery circles and a frequent speaker at abolitionist gatherings Sojourner Truth consistently and actively identified herself with the feminist cause from the early years of the American women's movement She attended the first National Women's Rights Convention in Worcester Massachusetts in 1850 the only black woman present Massachusetts was the center of abolitionist sentiment and the million and a half black women of the south 
still in slavery, were not forgotten by the convention delegates. A resolution was adopted referring to these women, quote unquote, the most grossly wronged and foully outraged of all women, and vowing that in every effort for an improvement in our civilization, we will bear in our hearts of hearts the memory of the trampled womanhood of the plantation and omit no effort to raise it to a share in the rights we claim for ourselves. The following year, Sojourner Truth was a participant in Women's Convention at Akron, Ohio, presided over by Frances de Gage. Gage later reported that some of the women present were far from happy at seeing Sojourner Truth walk in and begged the chairman not to let her speak, for fear that every newspaper in the land will have our cause mixed with abolition. The Akron Convention was marked by the presence of many men of the cloth, most of whom apparently were opposed to the granting of freedom to women. One based his argument in favor of male privilege on man's greater intellect, another on the manhood of Christ, another on the sin of Eve. Finally, the atmosphere of the convention became somewhat stormy. As Gage related to the scene, and I quote, slowly from her seat in the corner rose Sojourner Truth. Don't let her speak, gasped half a dozen in my ear. She moved slowly and solemnly to the front, laid her old bonnet at her feet, and turned her great speaking eyes to me. There was a hissing sound of disapprobation above and below. I rose and announced, Sojourner Truth, and begged the audience to keep silence for a few moments. The simple moving words of Sojourner Truth had an effect on the gathering that Gage described as magical. Beforehand, the minister seemed to be getting the better of the women, much to the delight of the boys in the galleries. But the speaker had taken up us up in her strong arms and carried us safely over the slough of difficulty, turning the whole tide in our favour. Sojourner Truth never learned to read or write. The speech she delivered at the Akron Convention was not officially recorded. It survives because it was written down by Frances Gage. It is reprinted below without the heavy dialect in which Gage recorded the words and without her interjected comments. I shall now quote from the speech directly. Well, children, where there is so much racket, there must be something out of kilter. I think that twixt the Negroes of the South and the women at the North, all talking about rights, the white men will be in a fix pretty soon. But what all this here talking about? That man over there says women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and to have the best place everywhere. Nobody ever helped me into carriages or over mud puddles or give me any best place. And ain't I a woman? Look at me. Look at my arm. I have ploughed and planted and gathered into barns and no man could head me. And ain't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as a man when I could get it and bear the lash as well. And ain't I a woman? I have born 13 children and seen most of them sold off to slavery. And when I cried out with my mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. And ain't I a woman? Then they talk about this thing in the head. What's, what's this they call it? Intellect, someone whispers. That's it, honey. What's that got to do with women's rights or Negroes' rights? If my cup won't hold but a pint and yours hold a quart, wouldn't you be mean not to let me have my little half measure full? Then that little man in black there, he says, women can't have as much rights as men because Christ wasn't a woman. Where did your Christ come from? Where did your Christ come from? From God and a woman. Man had nothing to do with him. If the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down all alone, these women together ought to be able to turn it back and get it right side up again. And now they is asking to do it. The men better let them. Obliged to you for hearing me. And now old sojourner ain't got nothing more to say. Uh, now Minakshi will read uh, from Mukta Bai. Mukta Bai. We have little biographical information about Mukta Bai. We know only that she studied at the school in Pune, founded by Savitri Bai and Jyotiba Phule. 
and when she wrote this essay in 1855 she was 14 of what happened to her letter or indeed of any of her other writings we have no record yet through her vivid and acrobatic polemic we get an unmistakable impression of intelligence and self confidence for an untouchable and a woman at that to write o learn pandits wind up the selfish prattle of your hollow wisdom and listen to what i have to say would be surprising even today in muktabai's times it was o oh, inspiring this piece was originally published in 1855 in nanodaya an ahmednagar jo- uh, journal that was de- uh, designed to disseminate information about such new scientific disciplines as physics and astronomy and also discussed religion and morality the essay was reprinted in the nanodaya Sere- century uh, volumes edited by b p hivle in 1942 it is probably the earliest surviving piece of writing by a mang woman and untouchable mang maharaja uh, dukha vishay about the griefs of the mangs and mahas if one attempts to refute on the basis of the vedas the argument of these brahmins the great glutons who considers themselves to be superior to us and hate us they counter that the vedas are their own property not obviously if the vedas are on, only for the brahmins they are absolutely not for us teach us o lord thy true religion so that we all can lead our lives according to it let that religion where only one person in privileged and the rest are deprived perish from the earth and let it never enter our minds to be proud of such a religion these people draw us the poor monks and mahas away from our own lands which they occupied to build large man- mansions and that was not all they regularly used to make the monks and mahas drink oil mixed with re- uh, red lead and then buried them in the foundations of their mansions thus wiping out generations after generation of these poor people under bajirao's rule if any monk or maha happened to pass in front of the gymnasium they cut off his head and used it to play a bat ball with their swords as a bat and his head as a ball on the ground if the victim managed to save his life and bajirao came to know of it he used to say how dare they save their lives do these untouchables expect the brahmins to hand over their duties as revenue officers to them and to start roaming with their shaving kits all over the town shaving of uh, shaving the heads of the widows with such a remark he used to punish them second were these brahmins satisfied with the prohib- prohibiting the knowledge of writing to us no not them bajira went to kashi and died a dusty death there but the mahas here no less untouchable than the monks have absorbed some of his uh, qualities through their contract with him and considered themselves to be superior to the monks so much so that they do not allow even the shadow of monks to fall over them do the merciless hearts of these brahmins who strut uh, strut around in their so called holy clothes even feel even a grain of pity for us when we suffer so much grief on account of being branded as untouchables nobody employs us because we are untouchables we have to endure miseries because we do not have any money o oh, learn pandits wind up the selfish prattle of your hollow wisdom and listen to what i have to say when our women give birth to babies they do not have even a roof over their houses how they suffer in the rain and the cold try to think about it from your own experience suppose the woman suffered from a puerperal disease from where could they have found money for the doctor or medicines was there even ever any doctor among you who ha- who was human enough to treat people free of charge the mang and maha children never dared lodge a complaint even if the brahmin children throw stones at them and injure them seriously they suffer mutely because they say they have to go to the brahmin's house to beg for the leftovers leftover morsels for food alas oh god what agony this i will burst into tears if i write more about this injustice super just carefully listen to both these voices of the 1840s and 1850s 
uh, the essay written by Mukta, the 14 year old girl in uh, Jyotiba and Savitri Bai Phule school, a uh, girl of the Mang ex untouchable community, so to say, and Sojono Truth, a freed slave woman. Uh, we might recognize immediately that they are talking at once about two simultaneously operating oppressions. In case of Sojona, racism and sexism, and in case of Mukta, caste and sexism. In a sense, if we go back to the different master frameworks that have been set for organizing diverse feminist feminisms or the history of feminist consciousness, where would we fit either of these voices or both these voices? So, in a sense, these voices bring more sharply to the foreground the fact that these frameworks, master frameworks for tracing the history of feminist consciousness have in a sense emerged from a specific experience, namely that of the white women's movement and its interventions in history, but has claimed to be universal, has claimed to have a universal uh, value for feminisms emerging in diverse contexts. And in a sense, therefore, to go back to Sandoval, who suggests, therefore, that we might, instead of this unilinear tracing of uh, the history of feminist consciousness, look at differential consciousness. How does a consciousness, oppositional consciousness of any kind, and also, therefore, feminist consciousness, consciousness that emerges in opposition to dominant dominance and power in that society, in a sense weaves within and across different modes of uh, consciousness. It could be the claim to equality, a revolutionary mode, a separatist mode, a supremacist mode. So, the, it's, it's woven within and across different uh, consciousness, so to say. And therefore, in a sense, these master frameworks organize feminisms in a way in which the dominant European American feminism is normative, it's the self and experiences of other feminisms, the histories of their consciousness either come to be backgrounded or in many ways are represented as only radically different from the uh, European American uh, dominant feminist consciousness or it comes to be in many ways uh, see it, it appropriates the experiences of uh, other women in a sense sees them only in terms of their lack from the dominant white feminist experience or in many ways objectifies their experience by suggesting that this is not feminist enough, this is not feminism. We know what is feminism or we can define what is in, for, in their interests, uh, so to say, or by just plainly homogenizing their experience, just suggesting that across all others, that is all those who are not white and first world, as if the experience of womanhood and therefore of feminist consciousness is as if the same. So, in a sense, therefore, there is an unequal representation of different or diverse feminisms that comes about. And if we go back to our example of the syllabus or the curriculum, then it's interesting to see how despite efforts to internationalize the curriculum, to bring in voices from across the globe, as Chandra uh, Talpade Mohanty points out, many of these uh, frameworks of the curriculum or of uh, the courses tend to assume either a traveler mode or an explorer mode. That is the first mode where the feminist as if is the uh, tourist, right? It's a tourist mode, moves away from the dominant European American normative feminism to briefly visit and often visit some uh, practice of cultural sexist discrimination, could be dowry, 
very briefly and as if but returns to the dominant european american experience as normative so in such a course the uh, the the experiences of feminist consciousness outside the dominant are completely lost the third world women emerge as if just victims always and already whereas it's the white first world woman who emerges as vital and dynamic whereas the explorer mode in a sense in seeks to internationalize the women's studies or feminism's curriculum by moving away from home so in an american university you move and have a course on feminisms in uh, africa or feminisms in asia but as if they are completely disjunct unconnected from the histories as if of women and feminisms in the home in the united states so in a sense you could have a course on feminisms in africa but say nothing through that course on racism and anti race feminisms in the united states right so what we will seek to do through this course is avoid as we move through diverse feminisms avoid both the tourist mode and the uh, explorer mode and try to develop a comparative relational mode of looking at diverse feminisms that is to say not to view the global and the local as geographical as territories but the way in which they constitute each other to try and see how diverse feminisms are different but how they are connected to histories of oppression exploitation resistance and struggle in a sense therefore the attempt to repeat will not be to enlist just multiple feminisms but to understand diverse feminisms a focus being squarely on the difference and how that difference comes to be uh, historically and therefore in, uh, in the next week we shall turn to looking at how do these unequal representations of feminisms come to be what may be the relationship between the unequal distribution of economic and political power globally and the unequal representation of knowledges in general and feminisms in particular and therefore as a background if you could uh, look at the powerpoint presentation on your course wiki uh, on on the history of uh, restructuring of uh, global capitalism the different way in which so to say simply put to understand how unequal uh, relations of economic and political power come to be globally then we would be in a better position to engage with the relationship between unequal relations of power and unequal representation of knowledge